good morning. So good. So good to be back with family. And I love that you know me because no one's sitting down. So you already so know me because, you know, I always love for us to be stood before I open the Word so we can honor the Word of God. We honor a lot of things and we honor a people, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves we need to honor not just those that are present in the room, but those that went before us, the heroes of faith that laid their life down so that we can learn from their journey. And so I love that we get a moment to honor the Word of God, but it's a joy to be with you. Like Pastor Jeremy said, I almost said Jer then. I have to remember him Sunday name for him is Pastor Jeremy. So, so as Pastor Jeremy just said, um, you know, this is family to me. I am, I'm not here because I had nowhere else to be. I'm here because I want to help build and cheer on what God is doing and loved being able to be at Thrive and see God move amongst the young people's lives. And just so thankful for the journey of this house and that myself and my family have got to be a small part of that with you guys. And so I have a word on my heart for you as a church, as an individual, as a family, and I'm just going to pray and ask God to do what only God can do today because God wants to help you today. And uh, I know that if you'll lean in, that God will hand you some things that you can walk out of here different because of. So God, we thank you for your word. There is no other word like your word. God, I pray today that you would deliver this word into every single heart. God, I pray today that we would allow you to do what you need to do for us to become more like you. God, today there will be a shifting and there will be a rearranging. God, I pray that your people would be bold enough to accept the challenge of your word and to do the work of your word. And God, I pray because of these few moments in your word that our lives would be better, would be stronger, would be healthier. And I pray I would get out of the way, God, so that you can have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may take your seats. Thanks, team. So I have been building church, serving in church for three decades now of my life. It's a long time to be doing the same thing. It's a long time to be serving and building and speaking and teaching the Word of God. And recently I began to think about an observation that I've seen over all those years of some things we do well in the church and some things maybe we don't do as well as perhaps we could do in the church. Some subjects that we major on and maybe some subjects that we haven't majored on. And I began to reflect as I began to observe my church and the people that I help build around the world church alongside. And just even thinking about the songs we sing and just thinking about the messages we preach. And I think we've done a pretty good job in ministering and in speaking and even in writing songs and giving uh, you language to understand that oftentimes we can feel broken, right? There's lots of messages that you've probably heard that I have heard about how God binds up those that are broken, restores those that are broken. We have appeals for people that feel broken, the brokenhearted, broken emotionally, broken in your own body maybe, in an illness that you are journeying or suffering from. And I think there's been good amount of word and a good amount of of teaching that helps us understand that God came to bind you up and to heal you and to fix what was broken. But I think a lot of times when we speak about brokenness, there's another category in the room who also need help that maybe we kind of don't give as much attention to. And that's the category today that I want to give some attention to and I want to minister to and I want to help because I think sometimes when we hear the word broken, we say to ourselves, well, I'm not broken. So this is not for me. You know, I think my life is pretty functional, so this message doesn't require a response from me. 
And I have realized there are a lot of people that are in the house of God and you may not say that you are broken or your marriage is broken or you feel like you're broken in heart, but you are, for want of a better definition today, I want to label some things that you are actually not broken, but you are out of order. Today I want to speak to those that are out of order of order. Have you ever gone to use a machine? Maybe it's a vending machine and you walk up to it and the lights are on and you can see the drinks and it's making the buzzing noise that the vending machine should make and and you go over to it and there's just a sign that has been attached to it to let you know though this thing is functioning partly, there is a part of this thing that is out of order. It's letting you know that it's almost correct but it's not fully correct. That it actually She has the lights and the chiller is still working, but there's one part of this that is out of order. And because there's one part of it that is out of order, it actually cannot do what it needs to do for you. And I want to say today that maybe your marriage is not broken, but it is out of order. Maybe there's something in your emotions that are not necessarily broken, but they are out of order. You are functioning, but you are not flourishing. You are living, but you are not thriving. You, you, are, you are on, but something is off. And I kind of want to speak to that because I think we have not so much identified this and spoken about of this. And I want you to have a life that is full, a life that is abundant, a life that is overflowing. And the only way that can happen is if we address what is out of order and bring it back in to order. And so that's kind of how I want to take us for the next few moments because what I've realized is when things are out of order, no matter what you do, until you address the part that is out of order, nothing is going to be aligned. It's kind of like your life is like this jacket and you fling your life on, your relational life, your emotional life, your spiritual life, your financial life, and And if this was your life, it's like you fling it on. But the best way to describe how your life looks is that right? It's like it's like it it's right, but it's wrong. It's good, but it's not great. It, 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 it's it's covering, but it's not functioning. And the reason why it's wrong is because the top button is wrong. And in life, if you do not understand what the top button should be, no matter how hard you work, no matter how much you try, until you get the top button right, no other button is going to find its right place. And I want to say to some of you today, your top button is wrong, which is why your marriage is off, which is why your parenting is stressful, which is why your money is in trouble, because the top button is wrong. You have a top button called success, and that is the wrong top button. You have a top button called popularity, and that is the wrong top button. You have a top button called my career, and it is the wrong top button. And no matter what you do, And no matter what you say, you have to understand until you fix it, your marriage won't feel right. The things inside your life will not come to peace because you're going to have to undo some wrong buttons to get the right top button. See, every button is necessary on this jacket, but if it's out of order, it does not fit right. And I want to say some of your life just doesn't fit. You are stressed out. You are, you are anxious. You have ulcers. You're feeling hot and sweaty. You are panicking about things. And today, you might not say I'm broken, but you are out of order. And God wants to bring you back into order. And so I want to help you today by giving you some principles. See, I think sometimes when it comes to talking about top button, the things that are priority in our life, I think what we really want is we want someone to kind of go, here's the, here's the five strategic things you should do to live an effective life. 
Okay, well, if you're looking for that message today, you're going to be highly disappointed because I have no idea what the five strategic things you do to make your life be highly effective because I don't live your life. So I have no idea. But what I can give you today are some top button principles that I have for the last 49 years of my life lived my life by. I have lived my marriage this way. I've lived my spiritual journey this way. And if we can get these principles as our top button, then we don't need five points of a strategy because our principles will determine what comes next. Jesus lived a life that actually when you think about it, it made no sense. Jesus came and did things in a way that we would go, well, that's not very highly effective, Jesus. That's not the best strategy, Jesus. I mean, Jesus had 33 years. That's not long, people. He had 33 years where he came to accomplish quite a big job. Hello. He was the savior of the world. And I don't know what you're managing or what your life looks like or what your corporate career is, but I'm pretty sure however important you think you are, you are not the savior of the world. So let's just get perspective. And yet, Jesus, I don't read one passage in Scripture. I have looked. There's not one verse in Scripture that says, and Jesus was so stressed out because he missed his two o'clock meeting, and now he had to roll his calendar, and now he had to rearrange his miracles, and now he was stressy because he was not going to be where he needed to be at the time he needed to be. So Jesus was running, and he'd not had time to eat, and Jesus was just feeling all the pressure of ministry on his shoulders. I don't find it anywhere. And I look at our lives and I'm like, people, what is wrong with us? We're anxious and we're stressed and we're running around on, on leftover dregs of energy. And we're not giving ourselves to the best things that we should be giving ourselves to. And Jesus models a life that had this rhythm to it and this grace to it. And we model a life that has more grind than it has grace. One of my life verses that I love and I live my life by is a verse that's found in Matthew 11, verse 28, where in the Message Bible it says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. In other words, are you, are you out of order? Because if you're tired and you're worn out and you're burnt out, maybe there's an area that's out of order. So Jesus is saying, come to me, I'm going to teach you a top button. Get away with me and you're going to recover and get your life back. And I'll show you how to take a real rest. And you're going to walk with me and you're going to work with me. And you're going to watch how I do it. And you're going to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Because I don't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. God's saying, let me get you back in order. I know you have stuff to do. I know you have a call on your life. I know you have a career. I know you have financial things that you're navigating. I know the job right now is not what you want it to look like. I know right now you're in a season where there's lots more questions than answers. But don't allow the top button to become stress or worry or doubt or anxiety. Let me teach you how to learn the grace, not the grind of the life that I'm calling you to. Jesus wasn't pushed around by people. Jesus wasn't, wasn't, wasn't forced to be where he didn't want to be. Jesus didn't live a life running here because they wanted him, running here because they wanted him. Even to the point of remember when Jesus' closest friend was ill, Lazarus, and, 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 and Lazarus' sisters are like, hey, Jesus, now would be a good time for you to change your schedule and come and help us. Jesus is like, I'm sorry, but I'll be with you when I'm with you because my top button is not forcing people forcing my agenda. My top button is doing the will of the Father and I love you and you have to trust that if I keep my top button right, then your, fa your family will be taken care of. But if I move my top button to respond to you, then I've moved the top button from God pleasing him to pleasing you. And so you have to understand that Jesus 
did not move his top button to satisfy friends, even family or religion or expectation. Jesus said in John 6, you want to know what my top button is? For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He was very clear. He was very clear what his top button was. So I'm going to give you three principles that I want to call top button principles for every single one of you today. Doesn't matter if you're single or married, if you're young or if you're old, if you have children or you don't have any children, doesn't matter if you're in ministry or you're in a career, these top buttons work for all of us. And these are the top buttons that I am committing to in my own life so that I do not end up out of order. And the first one that I want to talk to you about is this, mission must always be greater than position. When I first felt God calling me into ministry, God took me to a passage in Scripture. I'd like to say that the passage he took me to was exciting and, you know, one that I'd be like, wow, God, you must really think I'm awesome, but it wasn't. It was kind of this unusual story that was found in Exodus. And the story is in Exodus 17, and it's a random little insight to a battle that is going on and, and some people that are involved in helping that battle be won. And it says in this story that there was Joshua who was at the front line fighting the battle. And then there was Moses who was called to a hillside to lift his hands. And it goes this way. It says, Joshua went. He said, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other. So that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army. Where are my volunteers that are going to help me today to illustrate what God showed me when I felt he called me into ministry? We're going to have you be Moses right there in the middle. You can stand. I, I, I thought to myself, God, I read this scripture. I'm like, God, this is amazing. Are you telling me I'm going to be Joshua on the front line in my shiny armor, winning the victory for Jesus, fighting the enemy. I feel it, Lord. I'm called, Lord. Lord's like, no, nope, you're not Joshua. Oh, God, I get it. Am I tall and strong like Moses? Am I upholding the staff of the Lord that is seeking out the victory for all the people? And I said, but God said, no, you're not Moses. I'm like, but God, there's only other two other people that are mentioned. And they're really just glorified arm holders. And I'm really sure you don't want me to just hold an arm in ministry. Like that's for a junior. I'm pretty sure I'm more senior, Lord. And I felt God say, no, that's exactly what I'm asking you to be. Because I have a whole group of people who have made the top button profile, who've made the top button front line. But I have no one who understands, no, the top button is the mission not the position. And so here's Moses, and he's told to keep his arms up. And the Bible says, as long as his arms were up, Joshua was winning. So however good and cool Joshua looked, it actually made no difference whatsoever what Joshua was doing unless Moses' arms were lifted up. So a lot of people think that they're so this and they're so that, and like, no, 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 without this, Without that, you have no power and no authority. It's the staff of the Lord that's giving you the ground that you're taking. And so God says, I, I need Moses to do this. And Moses was there a long time, and it was a hot day. And, you know, he wasn't wearing a hoodie. He was probably wearing some kind of, of, of cloak. And I'm pretty sure there was no deodorant in those days. And so, you know, I'm saying, like, down draft is not a good place to be. And we live in a world where that position is looked down upon. 
And so everybody wants to exit the church and exit the kingdom because this is clearly not me, Lord. Clearly I'm made for something bigger than this. And we have a world that are chasing position when God is the one who's saying, no, look at the mission. And then you'll realize the importance of your role. And so when he got tired, his arms start to lower and Aaron and her, it says they came and they held his hands. And then they pulled up a rock behind him so he could sit. And they kept his arms up, and as long as his arms are up, we were winning. And if his arms began to fall, then we were losing. But as long as his arms were up, God's people were winning. This is the mission, that we find a place where we uphold the bigger picture for the things of God, for the kingdom of God. And what happens is, let me tell you, I've seen it happen in families. I've seen it happen in people's career. That the position in your career becomes more important than the mission of your family. And the position of the promotion becomes more important than your planting in the house of God. And the call of something that makes you look good is more important to you now than the call that actually does good. And so what happens is the enemy begins to tempt you to come away into position mindset. And when you come away and make your top button position, what you fail to see is in doing that, we've lost the bigger mission. And so when God showed me this, I realized what God was calling to me to draw attention to was there are too many people that are leaving for a position. And when they do, we are losing the battle that we're all called to be a part of. Where are those that will make the top button again the mission, not their position? Where are those that will say, it's the mission of my family, it's the mission of my finances, it's the mission of the house of God that I am connecting my life to. And if that button is right, all the other buttons are right. See, see, if your mission is not the top button, then you are up for manipulation. You can be bought, you can be tempted. And we end up finding that in the house of God, there is this sense of no one to hold the weight because everyone's looking for the limelight. When God spoke that to me at 14 years of age, I realized, man, I'm probably not going to be in the glamorous spot. I'm probably going to end up spending most of my life behind the scenes upholding someone's arms. But I have to remember when I'm doing that, I'm helping the mission be accomplished. Amen? You can take your seats. Thanks, guys. If position is priority, then the mission will become the casualty. Matthew 6, verse 33, you want to know what the top button is? (laughs) Pretty obvious, pretty clear, but seek first his kingdom, top button, and his righteousness, top button, and all these things, lower buttons, they will be given to you as well. Get the top button right and all that stuff will follow. Jesus was constantly reminding people of the top button. David said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than spend my time in the tents of the wicked. What's he saying? My top button is not position because I'll be the doorkeeper if I need to. I'll be the arm holder if I need to. The minute it becomes position, I'm going to think there's no point watching these sheep. There's no point being faithful. There's no point showing up when no one else is showing up. But if you're showing up because someone else is showing up, then you know what? You're going to compromise the mission over position. And we've got to get back to our top button. The disciples even tested Jesus. When they came, the mother of two of the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 20. They were like, Jesus, can I ask you something? He's like, what is it you want? She says, I just want to ask you, can my sons have the seat at the left? (laughs) And the seat at the right, she was a pushy mother. (laughs) She was like, I just want my boys to have the best position, Jesus. Could you give them the best position? Could you give them the best title? Be careful, parents. What we model to our children. Because inheriting a position that you do not understand the cost of will kill your children and kill your family quicker than anything else I know. 
And Jesus says, you have no idea what you're asking for. You're asking for a position and you have no idea of the price tag that is attached to that position. If I were you, I would follow the example of Jesus. And Jesus said, listen, I have the position. I, I am, by the way, savior of the world. But Jesus says, just so you know, even me, the son of man, did not come to be served, but to serve. I did not come for a position, though I could. I came for a mission. And if I'm going to lay my life down and I'm the son of man, how much more do you need to lay your life down? Jesus was trying to tell the disciples all the time, get the top button right, get the top button right, and all these things will be added. Where are you compromising? Because you'd rather have a position than you would the mission. Number two. Your motivation has to be greater than your expectation. This is huge. Do you know how many things we do with the mindset of, I'll do for you if you do for me. <laughs> I'll serve you if you serve me. I'll give if it benefits me. I'll show up if it's what I want to show up for. How much of our life have we moved from a motivation being set, a motivation being pure, to now our world and our life is based not on a place of motivation, but on a place of expectation. We've moved serving from being sacrificial to being transactional. We've moved our life's agenda from what's in it for me to actually instead saying, hey, I would rather just come and serve with no expectation of anything in return. Imagine if Jesus treated us that way. I'll forgive you if. I'll love you if. Imagine if Jesus had said, I'll heal you if. You know, Jesus healed people with absolutely no expectation of thank you. I know we read a story about 10 lepers and one going back and giving thanks, but you do know that Jesus would have healed all 10 lepers whether one came and gave thanks or nine came and gave thanks. He wasn't healing them based on what they would do for him. He was healing them because they were sick and his motivation was love and his motivation was restoration. Jesus didn't get on a cross and die for you with an expectation of how you would behave once he did this for you. He did it because he loved you no matter what you said, no matter what what you did, his motivation was set. And yet our top button has become expectation. Well, if I serve in the church, I expect applause. <laughs> well, let me tell you, you're going to be disappointed. There's going to be days where no one says thank you and no one applauds you. But if your service is based on expectation, then your top button is wrong. Because Jesus served and laid his life down for the same people that shouted, crucify him. Because he realized if I do it based on expectation, I'll never go and have nails in my hands and nails in my feet and lashes on my back. If I do it based on expectation, I'll never follow through. But Jesus did it based on his motivation. And his motivation was love. That's why when he was tested in Matthew 22, it says the Pharisees asked him, what's the most important law? And he said, I'll tell you what the most top button is. The top button is love the Lord your God with all your heart and passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the top button. It's the most important, the first on any list. When did we lose our love? You know, when you're in love, you do cray cray things. Do you remember that day? Like some of you have been married, I don't know, maybe 20 years, 15 years, I don't know. And you're like, yeah, yeah. But do you remember back when like, you were trying to get that woman to say yes or you were trying to get that guy to propose? Do you remember the crazy things you would do? Do you remember the way that you would take care of your appearance and you'd show up and you'd be like, like taking them out for dinner and buying flowers and like have your aftershave on? And, like, and like, you, were like, you were on it. You were, like, like you, were, you were on a mission. You were motivated by love. And then, you know, year two of marriage rolls by and your socks are all over the floor and your breath smells bad. And you're like, yeah, whatever. And when's my dinner going to be ready? And there's no more flowers being bought. Why? You lost the love. You just assume, you just expect. 
But Jesus says, no, no, you've got to have a motivation of love. Some of you, when was the last time you read your Bible? Because you were motivated by love, not because someone told you to. When was the last time you gave? Because you were motivated by love, not because someone guilted you into it. When was the last time you served? Not because someone was going to applaud you, but your motivation was, why wouldn't I do this? I want to love in a way that expresses itself with no expectation of return. Luke 6, verse 31, here's a shocking verse. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run of the mill sinners do that. Hello? If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? The Bible's saying stop making the top button expectation. Some of you right now, you are stuck. You are out of order because you're expecting a sorry from someone. You need to just realize it may come and it may not come, but your motivation is your choice. And if the top button is expectation of someone else's actions, you will remain out of order for a long time. The enemy has had some of you stuck for a long time waiting for a parent to say something or a person to come back and ask for forgiveness or a favor to be returned, which is not going to be returned. You've made the top button wrong and now all the other buttons are out of order. But when your motivation is love, no one can manipulate, no one can bribe, no one can control because your motivation is set that I love God and I lay my life down for him and I love my neighbor as myself no matter what my neighbor does back to me. Where's your top button? Is it based on your motivation or is it based on your expectation? If you are living from expectation, you will be manipulated You'll be compromised. Our service is not based on people's kindness. Our service is based on God's goodness. <laughs> Our service is not based on people's kindness. Our service is based on God's goodness. How can you ever not give or serve or love when he gave it all for you? Get the top button right. And finally, Top button, put legacy over temporary. You know, I got on an airplane and flew a long way to speak to a bunch of young people. One of the oldest people in the room kind of feel a little bit intimidated when they're all there and they're all jumping around like mad things. And you're like, I'm the old lady in the room this day I never thought had come, has come. I am now the old person in the room. But the reason I got on the airplane and the reason I come is because I realize it's legacy. And legacy matters more than temporary comfort in my own life. Legacy is what I'm here for. In Hebrews 11, it talks about the heroes of faith who saw legacy over temporary. And the Bible says that they, they would give and they would serve knowing that they would never receive in their hands the very thing that they longed to see. But the Bible says they waved at it in the distance. They saw it off afar and they thought to themselves, man, I'd rather live a life for that than live a life for this. We live in a world that's obsessed with Ikea. Don't fill your life with Ikea furniture. Because here's the thing I know about Ikea. It will get you through the year. But you certainly ain't handing it down to your children's children. <laughs> that thing is not going to be here when your children's children show up. You know what I'm saying? It's holding on by a wing and a prayer. I feel oftentimes we are so Ikea-minded I'll just buy what gets me by. I'll just do what gets me by. I'll just invest what benefits me. I'll just give to what actually I can see something will come back in my lifetime. But if we're going to build the kingdom, we have to put legacy as a top button. You have a legacy offering in a few weeks' time. And this was not something that Pastor Jeremy asked me to say. He had no idea what I was going to say today. But by the timing of God, can I remind you that when your pastor and your team get up here and say, can we give to a legacy offering? They're not just trying to get money out of your pocket. They're trying to get the top button right in your life. They're saying, we're supposed to be the heroes of faith today. They did it in their day. This is now our day to give to something beyond us. Live a life that is beyond you. 
I'm happy that maybe, you know, you got your, you got your nice house and your nice furniture and your nice social calendar. But honestly, if that's all we are living our life for, we have fallen short of the greatest life that we are invited into, a life that lives with a legacy mindset, a life that lives to make a difference in eternity, a life that actually gives itself. Some of you were at home over the last few days. You could have been down here serving. And I say, well, it's too noisy. So what? You used to be one of those kids. You used to be lost and confused. You know, kids in this generation are battling things you never had to battle social media and pressure and anxiety and suicide rates that are through the roof. We need older generation to rock up at the young people's conference and say, I'm in the back just to serve and to pray because I'm legacy minded. Instead of sitting in our rocking chair going, not my job, not my turn. You know what I'm saying? Like, where are the legacy minded? And legacy is your top button. You live your life like those heroes of faith. When motivation of love is your top button, you live a life like a disciple of Jesus. When mission is your top button, you live a life like those of the disciples. That when he said, follow me, they said, I'm following. We gotta get back to some top buttons that have got out of order because our culture have told us if we need to get ahead in life, we have to change the order of our buttons. I'm just here to let you know, the world don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> we don't live by their code. We don't live by their standard. God will promote and elevate who he chooses. If he can take a guy that was shoved in a pit and then put into a prison with a false accusation and make him a prime minister, don't you think that God can take your life and put your life where he needs it to be? But Joseph had a top button. He said, I am here because God placed me here and I'm not gonna be bitter in this jail and I'm not gonna get mad in this jail. What about Daniel? Daniel who wouldn't compromise. He wouldn't change his top button. When they said, eat this food, he said, no, I'm sorry. When they said, don't pray to your God, he said, uh-uh, I'm sorry. His top button was set. And because his top button was set, even when it was the choice of actually toe the line or go in a lion's den, he's like, my top button is chosen. I choose the lion's den because I'm not gonna start rearranging my life to suit your agenda. I'm going to trust when my life is buttoned the way God told me to, that God will show up in the den. He'll show up in the pit. He'll show up in the prison. He'll show up every time. Why? Because my life is not out of order. My life is in the right order. So today, all across the room, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. I'm telling you today, some of you are like, man, my marriage, it just, it sucks right now. And you're thinking you need some big drastic answer to your marriage. Can I tell you, some of your marriages are just going to come back in order when you get the top button right. When you start prioritizing the mission of your family over your personal preferences. We start putting things right in the home and say, no, our household will serve the Lord. The mission of our house is that we love God. The mission of my life is that I'm planted. You know what? That's why the Bible talks about tithing. It's trying to help you get your button right in your finance. God's like, if I don't have a part of your finance, your buttons are wrong. But if you put your top button right, all that other stuff will be added to you. Let God realign what is out of line today. So all across the room, just as eyes are closed. I'm going to ask just in general, if you're in the room today and you're like, you know what? I, I feel like there's an out of order. I feel like there's an area that's out of order. I feel like I've got to get my button right. I feel like I've got to make some adjustments. Right now, as eyes are closed, just lift your hands. It might be in your career. It might be just in your spiritual disciplines. It might be that right now you're like, man, I, I'm not in a place I should be with God. Man, right now in my marriage, I've put other things above this vow that I made. Man, I, I, I'm not putting the Word of God first in my life. I'm putting other stuff in my life. And maybe you're lifting your hands because you're like, man, God is not in charge of my life. I am in charge of my life. And today you realize you're not making a great job of it. You want to get it back in order? You've got to put God at the top. God, you see all these hands that are raised. God, I thank you for the honesty in the room right now. I thank you for the vulnerability in the room right now. Husbands and wives, parents and children, careers, that are represented, 
finances that are represented, emotional stress that's represented. God, it's out of order. But God, I thank you. You are the God that helps us get back into the rhythm of grace. You're the one that says, come to me, all that are weary. Come to me, all that are out of order, and I'll teach you, and I'll show you how to get your life back. God, I pray today that these hands raised, it will be the beginning of getting their life back. Not the life the world promises, but the life that you promise. A life that is abundant, a life that is full, a life that overflows, a life that has joy, that is its strength and peace that passes understanding. God, today, I pray for every out of order life would come back into alignment. I pray for boldness to make adjustments. I pray for some people to find the courage to say no to what they need to say no and say yes to what they need to say yes. And I pray as we make those adjustments that peace would flow like a river, that joy would return in the place where it's been joyless, that hope would be awakened where there's been a sense of hopelessness. As eyes are closed, just lower your hands. I'm going to ask finally one last specific thing. If God is not the top button, if He is not your Lord and Savior, if He's not the first in your life, today put it right. Put it right. And say, God, I need you. God, I want you. And if that's you right now and you're saying, that's me, just right now, just lift your hands and say, that's me. I need to put God first. I need forgiveness. I I need to repent. I need to come back to Him. So good. So good. You can just stick your hand on your heart and I'm just going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Everyone's going to say it with you to help you in this moment. Dear God, today I come and I lay my life down and God, I surrender and I call you my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me for loving me. Today is a new day and I choose to put you first in your name. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us. We hope you've been encouraged today. We say this all the time. We are not just a friendly church, but a family church. And we want you to know we are here for you. If you need prayer for anything, we would love to come alongside you and pray with you. Simply visit our app and tap the Get Connected button. You'll also find resources on how to take your next steps in your faith journey. Here at City First Church, we are passionate about generosity. And when we give, we are able to impact people globally in the name of Jesus bringing practical help and hope. If you were encouraged today, we would love to invite you to partner with us financially to give back to God through City First Church. Giving is simple. Click the link in the description or head on over to the app. We're so grateful for your generosity. Lastly, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again for tuning in here at City First Church. We'll see you next time.